All right, everybody. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for this Black Hills Information Security webcast. My name is Jason Blanchard. We got Deb here. Uh, we got Dale, who's going to be giving his web uh, webcast today. Very first Black Hills Information Security webcast. Uh, he's been doing security for a long time. I've known Dale for years and years and years. Probably one of the most uh, like skilled and knowledge person. And I don't want to like raise that expectation too high because it is his first, <laughs> and he might be like, "Oh, I don't know." Uh, but thank you so much for joining us. We do this every. Every single week. You can join us on Discord to get your questions answered from your fellow attendees. If you want to answer the questions of your fellow attendees, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. You can also ask questions on Zoom. We may get to them. We may not be able to get to them, but we'll uh, save the end for questions. Most likely, Dale will answer your questions throughout the course of the webcast, but if he doesn't, we'll make sure that we ask those questions at the end. And once again, thank you so much for being here. If you ever need a red team, threat hunt, pen test, active sock, anti sock, or anything else, you know where to find us. Dale, it's all yours. Ready? All right. Thank you. All right. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, if you didn't already know, my name is Dale. I am a tester here at Black Hills InfoSec. Uh, prior to, to joining Black Hills, uh, I did spend 18 years as a blue teamer, so I do have a little bit of experience in that area as well. And uh, I do have some certifications there. There's the alphabet soup on the bottom there that you can read if you really want to. So over the next hour, we're going to talk through or walk through a real world data breach from the perspective perspective of uh, Raymond, our security analyst. Uh, before we get into that, though, it's important, I think, to level set on the incident response process itself, because as we look through this breach, you're going to start to see some of the things that went well uh, and some of the things that went sideways. So uh, I'll introduce you to the organization as well as we'll talk a little bit about Raymond uh, and then we'll dive into the breach. So we'll touch briefly on the report itself, some of the lessons learned and uh, some of the financial impact. Uh, of the breach itself. And then we'll wrap things up at the very end with some key takeaways that hopefully uh, you can take back to your organization and learn from. All right, so there's a couple different incident response models out there. The one that I learned is the classic model taught by SANS, also referred to as Pickerel. Uh, that's also the same model that Raymond used as he was working through this incident. So uh, it makes sense to, uh, to stick with that model here today. So this model, there's six phases. The first one, the preparation phase, covers things uh, that should be done before an incident actually occurs. And before you start the, the, the actual incident response process itself, you first have to identify uh, any, that an incident has actually occurred. So once you've identified uh, all the compromised systems, systems then need to be contained. Uh, and then in the eradication phase, you know, we aim to undo whatever damage the uh, it was the attacker uh, had, had done. Uh, the steps that you take then to get back up and running is uh, to a business as usual state uh, is the recovery phase. And then finally, the lessons learned phase uh, which is the postmortem where typically uh, re re your report is, is finalized and presented. So if we talk about, first off, the preparation phase, it's important to know what is important to the business. So how do you know what systems are important to protect? Because realistically, not all systems are created equal and not all systems require the same level of effort to protect. So for example, do you need to, to protect and secure your printers? Absolutely you do, but they don't require the same level of effort as the database that contains your crown jewels. Uh, so what is the organization's stance on containment, right? Do you contain and clear the incident or do you watch and learn uh, the incident to see what's in, what an attacker is doing so you can learn from the process? So this will have an effect on how you navigate through that incident itself. What systems exist in your organizations? You can't protect what you don't know you have, right? If you allow your employees to bring in their own devices, uh, you're going to have a difficult time with this. Uh, are those systems patched up that these people are bringing in, right? So think about uh, the wireless access point that the security guard brought in from that he bought from Best Buy because he didn't know the password to your corporate Wi-Fi and he wants to connect his, his iPhone to the data plan or to the, to the network so he doesn't use up all of the data in his data plan, right? So is that the device actually configured securely or is it just default out of the box, wide open, that's now got a, a backdoor into your network? So also look at what types of log sources there are in your organization. Uh, do they uh, do the systems that you're logging align with those that you've determined to be important to the business? What are your policies and procedures? Um, how can they be enforced? Uh, better yet, can they be even be enforced at all? And then who do you notify? Right? Do you just notify the business themselves? Do you need to engage law enforcement? Any compliance you need to be aware of? Right? Are your retail operation where you need to notify banks or credit card companies? Right? And then what are your procedures for recovering systems? Right? Do you just clean them up and send them on their way? Or do you move them from high orbit and reimage the systems, right? So how quickly are you able to then reimage those systems if that's your if that's the course of action that you normally take? And then do you have an incident response team formed, right? Are they trained? How are they trained? Uh, and what is the makeup of that team, right? Is it just one guy doing security off the side of his desk, 
or is there a proper representation from all areas of the business? These are all things you need to take into consideration uh, and figure out ideally before an, uh, an incident actually occurs in your environment. All right, so when we talk about identification, you're looking at things like what sources of logs exist in your environment, right? You've got network firewalls, or sorry, network devices, you've got firewalls, intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. You know, don't, don't forget about your host devices, you know, your Windows event log, Sysmon, EDR, antivirus, right? And then what about your administrators and your users, right? Don't count them out, right? So oftentimes we make the mistake of seeing the, them as just dumb users, but they know their systems very well and usually better than what we know them, right? So they know what's normal and what's abnormal on a system. So if an administrator reports the server is slow and sluggish, is that an application, uh, an issue with the application or is it some kind of initial sign of a compromise, right? Because in order for an attacker to, to achieve their objective, they have to perform some kind of activity on the system. And oftentimes that activity leads to some kind of reduced system performance and that decreased system performance can be an indicator that something has gone awry on the machine. Then how do you verify an incident, right? Is it a false positive? Is it a true negative? A defaced website's pretty cut and dry, but it's not always that simple to identify, right? So once you've identified and uh, uh, verified an incident, then what's your next move, right? So how do you triage this, the affected systems? Do you deal with them all the same or do you triage higher value systems first? Uh, again, that's gonna uh, kind of steer you in the, in, as, as you're navigating through the incident itself. On the containment phase, the goal here really is to prevent the attacker from continuing their activities. So typically, an attacker is not going to dwell on one system. They're going to try and move laterally throughout the environment. So you want to be able to, to detect that activity uh, ideally, right? If they're able to hide on one system that you didn't know exist, then you're going to have a difficult time containing them, right? So that goes back to the preparation phase and knowing what systems you have in your environment. Uh, being able to isolate systems in a in a hurry is is key as well, right? If you've got an EDR, most of those EDRs today will allow you to put a system into isolation mode, uh, which will allow it to, uh, restrict it then to communicating only with the central console itself. Now, patching a system is also a viable contain stra containment strategy. Uh, you want to make sure you're able to deploy your patches uh, wide scale in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but be aware that a software patch is not always a silver bullet. Sometimes there is no patch. And sometimes an attacker just leverages a misconfiguration, right? So like patches, you wanna make sure you're able to safely deploy to safely deploy any necessary configuration changes out to systems, again, in a reasonable amount of time. And what's reasonable, that's for you to, to determine. So that could be through group, through group policy, or perhaps it involves manual configuration on all of the affected devices. And hopefully you know where all those devices are. Ideally, you can test those changes in a controlled fashion, but realistically, that's not always the case. Sometimes you just have to make a configuration change in a hurry without testing it and push it out and deal with whatever breaks. Uh, unauthorized accounts, you need to take into consideration. You should be able to detect and discover any rogue accounts and, and ultimately be able to remove them. The same thing goes with unauthorized processes or remote access tools. Again, this goes back to knowing uh, to knowing your systems, right? So if you install, if you allow your your end users to install whatever software they want, good luck. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough process. Firewall rules and router filters are often a simple uh, the simplest method of containment strategy. strategy. Uh, isolating them to, or a system to a quarantine or a private VLAN can sometimes buy you some time to contain the system while you try to figure out uh, what's, what's going on. And uh, ideally, uh, also be prepared that for the reality that taking a system offline is not your call. Uh, you will make the re recommendation, but at the end of the day, it's a business de business decision, and they will decide whether or not. Uh, they're willing to accept the loss of taking a, a business or taking a system offline. Um, so again, you don't get to make that decision. All right, while containment is stopping an attacker's actions, eradication is then where we undo whatever it is that the, the attacker did. So how do you do that? There's a few things. Number one, you can patch the system, right? Assuming that a patch is available. Uh, you can restore your systems and the data from known good backups. Uh, I put emphasis on known good backups. Uh, if you're not able to determine the point of compromise, then how do you know your backups are good, right? So if you were compromised three months ago and you didn't know it, you need to restore a backup from yesterday. How do you know you're not just restoring a compromised backup, right? So sometimes you need to just rebuild those systems from known good software media and then restore your data, right? Again, assuming that your data is, is good. So hopefully you test your backups and that you're able to verify the integrity of, those, of the data on those backups as well. Any accounts that the attacker may have created, and or used, you want to be able to remove them or reset the passwords. If you don't 
Uh, if you don't have the ability to, do, to determine what accounts were used, you may be in a situation where you might have to force a password change of all accounts in the environment. Now, this can get tricky, especially when it comes to service accounts. So knowing which service accounts are used on which systems is something you need to have documented in your preparation phase. Uh, don't forget also about any fraudulent transactions, right? So if, a, uh, if an attacker compromised your bank accounts, uh, your finance teams need to going to need to know about that. They're going to have to deal with the banks. They may have to dispute charges. They may have to issue refunds to customers. And identifying the root cause of an incident is not always easy, right? If you think of a compromised account with a weak password, the weak password itself is not actually the root cause. The root cause is actually the password policy that allowed or enabled a user to create a password, a weak password in the first place, right? So the point is here that eradication is not always an easy task. A lot of times there's a, a huge mess to clean up before you're ready to move on to that recovery phase. And sometimes you do have to cycle through the identification, containment, and eradication phases before you're even ready to move on to the recovery phase. All right, now if all goes according to plan, it's time for the business to get back to normal operations. So believe it or not, when you factor in hidden accounts, backdoors, rootkits, and so on, uh, more often than not, it's a more cost effective, more cost effective to just rebuild the system. It's also a lot less stressful. Uh, if you think about it, no matter how good your plan is, you're always going to have in the back of your mind that what if, right? What if you didn't clean it up properly? What if you missed something? Do yourself a favor. And if it's all at all possible, to, uh, rebuild the system and deploy uh, fresh hardened systems, right? So key the key there is, is hardened systems, right? So you don't want to just deploy systems with the exact same configuration and the same patch level. If you do, you're just doomed to repeat uh, this process all over again. Ideally, it's best to restore a system during um, during uh, sorry after business hours. The uh, main reason why is that it's easier to monitor a system when there's a decreased volume of traffic on it. And unfortunately, it's not always possible though to um, to restore those after after uh, business hours. Typically, the business wants to get back to, to normal as soon as possible, and uh, they will you know they they'll kind of lead the charge as far as how how quickly they'll tolerate you leaving that system offline. So ideally, again, after hours is definitely recommended. Now, again, just like taking systems offline during the containment phase, it's likely not your decision when you get to put the systems back into production. There's usually pressure from the business as well as the system owners to get things back to, to normal. Uh, and sometimes that happens before you're ready. So make sure you've done your due diligence to ensure the greatest chance for a successful recovery. All right, the lessons learned phase is the last phase, and this is a very important phase is often missed or, or skipped over. This is typically where the report's finalized. Uh, you know, you want to include a summary report for the executives and then a detailed technical report uh, for, for the technical staff itself. This is also the best time to ask for any upgrades. There's often a lot of momentum here. Uh, usually security is top of mind. Uh, just be aware that the momentum will fade very, very quickly. So you want to strike while the iron's hot. Uh, you want to discuss any fixes you've implemented as well as any fixes that are still in the works. And then don't forget about your policies and procedures. You want to identify which ones enabled you and which ones held you back and hindered you. All right, so which areas did you really do well in and which areas were a dumpster fire? Those are the areas that you want to cover here as well. And then probably one of the more important things is be careful not to fall into the trap of laying blame, right? It's inevitable that someone is going to want to know who to blame, whose head's going to roll, right? So don't fall into the trap. Uh, stick to, stick to, to the facts of the incident. All right, so let's talk about the organization now itself. Dale. So, Yes. I got a quick question for you. Go ahead. When do you make the decision to preserve information for forensics or just nuke and pave and not worry about preservation? Um, that depends on the stance of your organization. If they just want systems back online and they don't care about the investigation, uh, you may just skip over that. If if there's a chance that the incident may go to court, uh, you're probably going to want to make an image of the system before you start doing anything to it. Cool. Thanks, Dale. Yeah, no problem. All right. Now, Acme is a clothing manufacturer based in the United States. They have an annual revenue of $800 million. Uh, they have a single manufacturing plant as well as one online store and 55 factory outlet stores located across the United States. The organization consists of 5,000 employees, a small IT team of 10 staff members, one of which is a senior admin, uh, you'll know him as Raymond, who's also responsible for security off the side of his desk. Now, one thing to note here that Acme was uh, level two PCI compliant, Level two means that the organization can self-assess and does not require an auditor or a third-party auditor to come in to, to verify the, the assessment. The organization did have uh, next-gen uh, firewalls at each location. They had Fortinet firewalls, uh, IPsec VPN tunnels connecting back to the data center. They had a centralized 40 manager in place. 
uh, for, for configuration management and, and uh, security and event log configuration. They also had a, an alien vault sim in place. Uh, Windows, Windows Defender was in place and was centrally managed by uh, what's formerly called SCCM. I'm not even sure what it's uh, what name it goes by now today. Uh, and that was deployed uh, across the organization. Now, Carbon Black was also implemented on all systems, along with what was at the time uh, uh, called Bit9. Now, Bit9 was a separate product back then. As many of you know, Carbon Black bought Bit9 uh, and renamed them to Carbon Black Defense and Carbon Black Protect. But uh, at that time, uh, Bit9 was not fully implemented at the time of the incident. Uh, they were mid-implementation, and it was configured for uh, to, uh, applicational allow listing was configured, but it was in low enforcement mode, so it wasn't really blocking uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of the, the the stuff. Log me in was also used to facilitate remote support for the IT team. Now, I do want to point out here that even though I specifically named a few different vendors, uh, it's not really important which vendors Acme was using. Uh, at the at the issues during the incident uh, were either due to poor implementation or misconfiguration and were not actually uh, any uh, shortcomings of the product itself. Uh, so this could have occurred with any particular pen, uh, vendors. Uh, I just you know wanted to point that out. All right, so as we start getting into timelines now, this uh, this incident happened in the uh, beginning of December, December 1st of 2016, 2.30 in the morning. Uh, the first email alert was received from Carbon Black indicating that uh, there was a hit on the SANS threat intelligence feed, indicating a suspicious use of uh, svchost.exe on a computer, uh, Win 701. Uh, nobody bothered to check this email alert. It was at 2.30 in the morning. Uh, between 2.32 and 7.52 a.m., there was an additional 58 email alerts uh, that all uh, indicating suspicious activity. Uh, no one paid any attention to any of these. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon, three fifteen in the afternoon, uh, another email alert from the same computer came through, uh, indicating that the computer was reinfected, uh, and then there was eight subsequent email alerts that came in and that were all ignored. Now, between two thirty-one in the morning, when the first email alert came through, and three fifteen in the afternoon, there were a total of sixty email alerts that nobody paid attention to. Uh, so you're probably wondering why did nobody pay attention to these? So, uh, first off, everyone was busy. Everyone thought uh, that someone else was dealing with it or that the tools they had in place were going to take care of it. Uh, and a lot of the emails just got lost in their inbox. Uh, it was later discovered that many of the uh, IT staff uh, were simply annoyed with the, the volume of email alerts that were coming from the system, uh, also known as alert fatigue. So rather than uh, working with the uh, with Raymond uh, and the security, well, Raymond, the security guy, uh, rather than working with him to fine tune the alerts, uh, to make them more relevant and meaningful, uh, they simply created rules in, in Outlook that automatically moved the emails as they came into different folders. So they weren't actually seeing the emails at all. So it was a case of out of sight, out of mind. Now, by just before four o'clock in the afternoon on that first day, uh, the organization was again related, alerted to a virus infection on a different computer. Uh, this computer was owned by Acme, but it was actually outside of the corporate network located at a contractor's head office. Uh, the triage process was followed on this particular one. They determined that uh, they would simply proceed with removing uh, the, the virus infection on the computer. And being that it wasn't connected to the network, uh, determined that it was not necessary to investigate uh, uh, further at this time. Uh, the policies and procedure dictated that when the system was brought back to the office, it was going to be wiped and re-imaged before placing on the corporate network anyway, so they weren't overly concerned about it. Now, by about just after 5 o'clock, 5.17 p.m., uh, to be exact. Uh, another email for a second computer came through and again indicating a virus infection. Uh, the email specifically said uh, that it was uh, successfully quarantined. So, you know, why would anybody even bother, anyone even bother checking it, right? The email said it was su successful. Yeah, they just moved on with their day. S uh, 6.37, another email for two more, uh, two additional computers that were infected. Uh, one of those computers was reinfected. Uh, again, nobody from the IT team checked on these emails or even responded to them. Uh, if you look at the time of the email, this one was after, actually after hours. Uh, so the on-call person should look after this, right? But problem is, uh, there was no on-call person. They didn't have an on-call uh, rotation. Uh, There's no after-hours support that would have even uh, received these emails in the first place. So uh, they kind of they went uh, into the inbox that nobody bothered to, to, to look at. All right, 7.30 at night. Another email indicating an additional computer was infected. Three more were reinfected. And then between 7.47 and 8.02 p.m., four more emails indicating another two computers infected. 
uh, eight o'clock. Another alert from Carbon Black indicating another hit on the SANS threat intelligence feed. Uh, again, for SVC host.exe, uh, followed by three more alerts. So in total between uh, the first email alert at 2.31 on December 1st and the, la the last one at 6.30 p.m. on December 2nd, uh, a period of 28 hours, a total of 238 email alerts were, were received, uh, indicating that there was, a, there was an issue and uh, nobody paid attention to any one of them. So uh, if you're noticing the pattern here, uh, most of these emails were after hours uh, when no one was online paying with them or paying attention to them. Uh, the ones that were during business hours uh, were either not seen because everyone was busy. If you recall, Raymond, uh, who was responsible for security, uh, was also a senior admin and security was just something he was told to do off the side of his desk. So a lot of these emails uh, you know, were also just flat out ignored, right? I think you know, remember back to the, to the uh, Outlook rule where these emails were just pushed off into another folder uh, so that people's inboxes didn't blow up on them. So finally, by about 11.24 in the morning on December 2nd, uh, somebody finally started paying attention to these emails and they felt uh, a virus outbreak was in place. Uh, it's shocking, I know. Uh, all computers were investigated and determined that uh, Windows Defender was in fact removing the infection, but could not complete the removal process until a reboot of the computer was performed. So all computers got rebooted and this appeared to end the reinfection cycle. So by about noon, uh, Raymond, uh, had, had reached out to, to Bit9. Now recall that Bit9 was mid-implementation. Um, Bit9 does not actually provide instant response services, but because it was during the, instant, during the uh, implementation, uh, the, this, the support agent that agent or Raymond was working with uh, agreed to use this as a case to kind of try and to, uh, to explain and show through how to filter out, um, how to filter the various different, uh, you know, events and whatnot within the product itself. So they were able to then discover and block a lot of these malicious files that were that were initially detected, which was great, you know, but they didn't have to do that. It was, uh, you know, it was nice that they did. All right, so how this actually played out, the infection itself was that at 10 after two in the morning, an unknown, unknown file named 2.vbs was written to uh, a computer, the Win701 computer. That process then executed an FTP connection to an external FTP server, at which point a second malicious file was downloaded to the same computer. Uh, this one was called, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that, sindinocaspel.exe. This also launched an FTP connection to the same uh, external FTP server, at which point a new file called update.exe was dropped on the disk. That created a new file called winsrv.exe. Uh, that file slept for a few hours, and then made an outbound connection on TCP port 443 to an IP address located in Moscow, followed by another connection to uh, on port 80 to an IP address loaded in Prague, Czechoslovakia. So that's how the, the initial infection uh, played out. Now, so as an initial response, there was a couple of things they did. First off, they banned the, uh, in bit nine itself, they banned winsrv.exe and 2.vbs. Uh, they did use the hash value, which was great. A banning by file name, not an ideal uh, choice. It will work in a pinch, but this could cause some issues as sometimes malicious files are named the same as legitimate files. So if you just block by a file name, you could actually uh, block a legitimate file that needs to run. So banning by hash is a better, is a better choice. Uh, still can be bypassed though. As many of you know, simply adding a white space into the file name uh, will change the, the hash value. So not uh, not an, an ideal solution either, but uh, it's better than nothing, right? So some firewall rules were also created to block all inbound and outbound traffic to these suspicious IP addresses. Again, this is uh, another short, uh, short term stopgap. It's fairly trivial for an attacker to just switch to different IP addresses for their attacks. At this point, the IT director was advised of a suspected intrusion. Now, Thing here is it's important to declare an incident sooner rather than later, right? So you're better to declare early and uh, and be wrong than not to declare at all. Just don't be too overly concerned with the optics of declaring an incident. Uh, is it going to ruin someone's day? Yeah, absolutely. And probably it's probably going to be your day that it ruins. Just be aware that you don't end up being the boy who cried wolf. You don't want to call, cry incident uh, uh, anytime something comes up, right? So if you, spec if you suspect an incident, Gather as much information as you can to make a strong case before you declare it, and then you can always stand down from an incident uh, if it ends up being a false positive. All right, so as, as Raymond started working through the incident, the correlation between the infected computers and the, uh, didn't really seem to make a lot of sense. So he started looking at some of the common factors 
and decided that LogMeIn, which they were using for remote so support, uh, seemed to be a common access, access mechanism for all these computers. So through investigating the access logs around the time of infection showed an abnormal access for a particular user account called R. Hansen. Now, further investigation showed that there were successful logins from a single IP address, and that IP just happened to be the same IP as the FTP server that the malicious software called out to. And the timestamps lined up with the, with the suspected time of compromise as well. So we notice uh, in the screenshot that the attacker first logged in at 2 a.m. on December 1st, and then again at 11.30 p.m. on the same day. In both cases, uh, the logs indicated that the attacker uh, logged in and accessed approximately 10 systems at each time. Uh, so what Raymond did here was uh, contacted the owner of the account, forced an immediate password change uh, on, on the account itself. Now, the incident or the investigation also showed that the hacker used the cached local admin credentials that our Hansen had saved under his user account. So these cached credentials in LogMeIn meant that they were able, the user was able to cache the credentials for the local administrator account so that he didn't have to type it in every time he wanted to connect to the computer. So uh, this was a feature in LogMeIn and a feature that the attacker took advantage of. So Raymond then forcibly uh, removed, uh, moved that all the cache credentials out of the system itself for all user accounts and restricted the ability for users to even save cred cache credentials. So probably something that should have been done in the first place, but hindsight is 2020 and he didn't, they didn't know any better. All right, so on December 3rd at 2.30 in the morning, between 2.30 in the morning and 4.30, after the pass user's password was reset, that night there was an additional 16 uh, attempts to log in to the R. Hansen's account. Fortunately, there were no successful logins. So it was, it was assumed then that the attacker uh, came back, tried to log in, credentials no longer worked and, and moved on to something else. So. Nine o'clock in the morning, uh, Raymond then reached out to log me in, let them know the malicious IP addresses. The same thing with uh, the Continuum data centers. No, Continuum data centers was the owner of the malicious FTP server that was uh, that was in use. So he advised them of, this, of the suspicious activity as well. Never did hear anything back from them. Um, wasn't really expecting to, but he thought he would keep them in loop just in case there was anything they could do. Now. Raymond had just recently been to a security conference where he met someone that we all know as Malware Jake. At the time, Jake was the owner of Rendition InfoSec. Uh, Rendition, Rendition InfoSec, I believe, was purchased by BreachQuest. Uh, not really important for this case, but um, so nine o'clock in the morning on December 6th, uh, Jake and uh, uh, Raymond had a conference call to discuss a statement of work uh, pertaining to incident response retainer and forensic services. Now, fortunately for, for Raymond, uh, Jake was able to mobilize, mobilize his team on very, very short notice. Uh, this is not normal, uh, so especially without a pre-existing retainer in place. Typically, uh, you're not going to get someone who's uh, on the phone and mobilizing his team while you're still having the conversation with him. Right? So once the statement of, of work was signed, uh, which took 24 hours to get it signed on the Acme side of things, uh, at that point, then Raymond started shipping uh, systems off to rendition InfoSec for them to begin their investigation. Now, in some cases, entire systems were shipped over, uh, but it was quickly discovered that full disk encryption was not enabled as they initially thought it was. So uh, they switched gears a little bit, and rather than shipping the systems themselves, they then started to create images of the systems, store them on a, encrypted external hard drives, and then ship the external hard drives themselves. So uh, one of the things that was missed in the, in the uh, preparation phase was you know, obviously verifying that full disk encryption was enabled everywhere. Now, on December 8th, at 3.28, Raymond gets a phone call from the bank uh, advising of a possible breach. So this is quite common for a breach to be identified by a third party. Uh, Raymond then advised them they were already aware of the issue, had already contained the incident, and unfortunately, the bank was insistent that Acme needed to have a conference call to discuss the incident itself. So uh, seven days after the initial call, uh, December 15th, uh, is when the conference call happened. Uh, that conference call was between the IT director, the CFO, uh, the bank, and Raymond. So prior to this call, Acme did a bit of homework. They did an investigation of all the credit card transactions that took place at all of the affected outlet stores uh, during the time of the initial breach and uh, during the time of and containment. Uh, confirmed potentially 86 credit cards based on the credit card transactions. Uh, and the bank traced those down to being four of their retail locations and instructed Acme then to engage uh, PFI services. So PFI for, for non-PCI people is uh, PCI Forensic Investigator, uh, also known as open your wallet, this is gonna be pricey. 
Now, finding a PFI was not as, as easy uh, as you might think. Uh, December 16th, one o'clock, uh, Raymond tried calling Dell SecureWorks. Uh, they did not have availability to take on this case. Uh, 1.30, he had a call with CrowdStrike, also not available. Two o'clock in the afternoon, uh, he reached out to Verizon and Trustwave, couldn't even get anybody on the phone. Uh, left voicemails for both uh, and didn't hear anything by the end of the day. 9.30 the next morning, uh, called Trustwave again, left another voicemail. Uh, finally heard back from them an hour later and to the, his surprise, they were also not available. Uh, this, that same day, December 19th, two additional days later, they finally got a call with Verizon. Uh, Verizon, fortunately, was available, which was great. So they sent over a statement of work uh, that was forwarded to Acme's CFO and IT director, which took another 24 hours to get it signed, at which point, December 21st, sorry, December 21st, was when they had the initial kickoff call with Verizon. Uh, at this point, Verizon then kind of... Uh, uh, provide the required information to set up file transfer facilities and so on and so forth. So this process took five days. This goes back to the preparation phase, right? You want your retainers in place before an incident actually happens. Don't expect things are gonna happen very quickly uh, during when an incident is, is ongoing. So you're gonna wanna plan ahead for this type of stuff. Now, in between trying to find a PFI, the chief operating officer decided that he wanted to bring in an external third party consultant to assist with the investigation. Now, this consultant just happened to be a friend and former business partner of the CEO that he implicitly trusted. So, of course, conference call between the COO, CFO, IT director, the security consultant, and Raymond uh, to, to, to discuss the uh, the course of action to lock down these retail stores. So, Raymond shared the investigation notes with the third party, who ultimately uh, supported and agreed with his, with his theory and his strategy, which was great. The CEO was happy with the plan, Raymond was happy, and everybody moved on. Now, this was a bit of a, a frustrating process for Raymond. He felt things were under control, didn't really feel the need for the third party. However, the COO was insistent and uh, you know, the third party, um, it was something that he knew and someone that he trusted. So point here is, is really to you know, swallow your pride, don't take things personally. In the long run, this actually worked out uh, well for Raymond. Uh, the fact that the consultant agreed with him and supported his strategy, uh, built confidence with the COO as well as the executive team, which was great. Now, some initial remediation, remediation steps that were taken, uh, they restricted all IP-based traffic to North America. Uh, Acme felt that there was no legitimate reason to allow any traffic to or from outside of North America, considering their customer base was within, the, within, the, within North America. Uh, they prohibited all use of applications with exception of business critical needs like email, point of sale, uh, you know, the ability to log in for IDP, to ADP for, uh, for, time, um, for your timesheets. Everything else like social media, general web browsing, all that was, was temporarily restricted. This also expedited the, the installation of new point-to-point -point encrypted pin pads for all the retail stores. The pin pads that were in use at the time uh, were the older style pad pads that processed through the actual point of sale till itself. Uh, this was a progress or a process that was, sorry, a project that was already in progress, but uh, this incident uh, expedited that process. So all these changes were rolled out in stages over a 24 hour period. And an hour after they rolled out the last change, the tech support team started receiving multiple tickets from multiple locations indicating that their mobile point of sale system uh, was not working, right? So mobile point of sale, these were a little handheld iPods similar to what you see in an Apple store uh, that could process the credit cards and connected directly to a dedicated wireless network. So an analysis of the firewall rules revealed that the firewall rules were too restrictive and that the mobile devices needed to make legitimate calls out to Ireland, Hong Kong, and the Netherlands. Uh, so the rule set was modified and everything went back to working normal. So this goes back to the preparation phase again, right? Uh, Acme had no idea that the network traffic would be going to Ireland, Hong Kong, or the Netherlands. In fact, the pin pad vendor themselves had no idea that where the traffic was going. So this is something that could have very easily been tested in a lab as part of the testing phase prior to deployment. Uh, unfortunately, uh, security was not involved in that process. And so, uh, that was missed. And uh, yeah, let's uh, ship some more stuff as well, right? More shipping of, of systems to rendition. Now, December 19th, one o'clock, uh, we had the first call, or Raymond had the first call with rendition InfoSec to discuss some indicators of compromise. Uh, preliminary inspection of uh, R. Hansen's laptop indicated some suspicious IP addresses that were rela related to a couple of files that you can see in the image there on the slide. Uh, and then we can uh, Raymond confirmed these presence uh, of these files in, in bit nine itself and added them to the band list. So rendition infosec's uh, investigation revealed 
An additional 29 suspected IP addresses and 16 domain names are all registered by the same person, some fellow named Marek uh, Kazuski from Poland. Uh, no idea if this was a real person or a fictitious name or not. Uh, so Raymond then searched through uh, Bit9, Carbon Black, their 40 manager logs, their SIM logs for any activity. And during this process, it was discovered that their 40 manager, while it was, con was configured to retain one terabyte of logs, which should have been sufficient, there was an issue. The underlying disk issue, disk partition itself, uh, did not support one terabyte of disk space, as it was only configured out of the box with a one gig storage partition. Uh, Raymond went back to the, the deployment uh, documentation and found that it was clearly outlined in the disk requirements that expanding that initial partition was required. Uh, unfortunately, it was missed. Uh, as a result, their logs were rolling over sooner than expected, and some in their actual log retention was around a day or so. So late at night on December 19th, uh, just after 11 o'clock at night, Raymond got a call from the CEO and the president and, and who wanted to, to talk through the incident. So he requested a couple of things. He wanted Raymond to look at the investigation, the suspected containment and time, analyze the number of credit cards uh, that were had taken place during that time. Raymond explained that that was already done, which was fine. Um, he also ex asked Raymond why they couldn't just search through the firewall logs for all IP addresses and identify the bad IP address. So Raymond did have to explain a couple of things. There's over 4 billion IP addresses, IPv4 addresses. Uh, the one they're looking for is not going to have a big label on it that says bad. And he had to explain the issue of the firewall logs that were misconfigured and not being retained as they were expected to be. So point here, uh, you're going to have uncomfortable conversations. They're going to happen at inconvenient times. They're going to be late at night. They're going to be early in the morning. They're going to be when you're tired. You just got to kind of roll the punches. They're going to ask you for things that flat out just don't make sense to you, at least. That might make sense to them, but to you, they're going to seem like dumb ideas. But the thing here is keep your wits about you. Stick to the facts. Make sure, you, make sure things are clear. The C-suite is not dumb, but they don't know the technical details and nuances of, of security, right? That's why they hired you. So you can't expect them to learn our language. It's up to us then to explain things to them in the language that makes sense to them. All right, so 8.30 PM on December 20th, uh, there was some additional um, revised clean uh, date and timestamps. Uh, uh, additional malicious file that was not previously seen, the link to the compromise. And 11 of the computers uh, that were initially thought to be remedied because they were supposed to have been rebooted uh, did not actually get rebooted until uh, later than was expected. It was I believe it was about 12, 24 hours later than was expected, which expanded the time frame a little bit. And of course, more stuff to ship off. And now at this point in the game, it's December 24th. They are 23 days into the investigation and just now starting to work with Verizon. So they're required at this point now to ship images to Verizon as well as manage the images that were sent to and from Rendition InfoSec. And the indicators of compromises and findings from Rendition were also shared then with, with Verizon itself. So Acme then started shipping more images and drives to, from, and between Verizon, uh, Rendition InfoSec, and, and Acme's head office. So the reality here uh, is that hackers do not not care about your holiday plans. Even though it was Christmas, Raymond was technically supposed to be off on Christmas Day and Boxing Day, uh, he found it very difficult to shut off the, his thoughts about the incident. Uh, his mind was constantly running through the, the incidents, uh, the events of the incident. Uh, he was on edge and stressed. Uh, unfortunately, due to this mental trans or mental distraction, Raymond did not enjoy a nice relaxing holiday season with his family. Poor Raymond. Now, on December 27th, there was a sync up call with Rendition InfoSec and Acme, and it was discovered that CCleaner was ran on R. Hansen's laptop on December 7th prior to returning it to security. There was a directory structure on the desktop called Meow Scenarios. Uh, now, Meow Scenarios was uh, some research on that showed that it was an online game uh, at, the, uh, at the Adult Swim site. And this, this folder uh, uh, appeared to contain some documents that Rendition InfoSec considered to be of a sensitive nature, as well as a self -extract extracting zip file. So, Raymond and the IT director then had a, a discussion with R. Hansen about his laptop. They inquired about any games or applications that he may have installed. Uh, he insisted that he did not install any games. And when asked about the Meow Scenarios folder, um, why it was created on in his desktop in July, 
and then deleted on December 7th. Um, he advised that Meow Scenarios was a joke name he shares with a group of friends, and any relation to the online game was just purely coincidental. He did, however, admit to removing uh, the Meow Scenarios folder to an external hard drive prior to Senate renting his laptop to, uh, to the IT department. Uh, unfortunately, he, Raymond was, or R. Hansen was unable to point out anything to the best of his knowledge that could have led to the compromise of his of uh, his laptop and or his login in account. So again, users are not gonna tell you all the information. Uh, in this case, he moved the Meow Scenarios folder to an external hard drive uh, before he sent it to IT because he was worried it looked suspicious and he didn't wanna get into any trouble. All right, so as you're questioning users, uh, you know, don't play the good cop backup thing, make them feel, uh, make them feel at ease, you know, don't don't lay the blame game. Uh, keep to the facts, keep emotion and theories and suspicions out of it. You know, you don't want to make them feel uh, like they need to hide information from you. All right, so on December 30th now, um, Verizon identified a key logger within the page file on one of the compromised systems. Um, fortunately, Acme was able to do a memory dump of the system before they send it uh, before they send it to to Verizon for analysis. Um, Verizon also reported some suspicious drivers that were installed on the systems during the timeline compromise. Uh, oddly enough, both VirusTotal and Bit9 reported these files as clean, um, but uh, the, the chances are that they're probably just um, newly created binary files that Bit9 and VirusTotal had not seen before. So had Bit9 been in high enforcement mode already, these binaries would not have been able to execute and then breach likely would not have happened in the first place. All right, so this, finally, January 11th, over a month after the initial uh, detection of the compromise, finally Verizon arrived on site at Acme's head office. Uh, and the first thing they did was image a bunch of systems and ship them back to their office. So over the course of the next two weeks, Verizon proceeded to ship six additional system images, three more encrypted hard drive, firewall logs from all compromised outlet stores, uh, and then of course the bit nine logs as well. So a couple of things here. Uh, that I'd like to point out. Many people get defensive when they have an investigator in their business. The investigator is not there to make your life miserable. They're there to find the truth, right? So treat them kindly, make them feel at ease, take the time to get to know them a little bit, right? Is it gonna help your investigation? Probably not, but why be a jerk, right? They don't wanna be there living in a hotel, eating takeout food uh, any more than, than you want them there, right? So they'd rather be home, going home every night to their family. So um, yeah, you have never know. Also, you may make a good business contact out of it. Right. So try to hide information from them also uh, because you think it may make might make you look bad uh, is not going to benefit for you. You got you got breached. It already looks bad. So any hiding information only raises suspicion and makes things look potentially worse and can drag out the investigation. All right. So this brings us to February 10th of 2017, over two months after the breach was detected. Verizon's report confirmed that investigations conducted by ACME um, uh, verify the use of, a, of the compromised uh, log me and user credential. Uh, that user's credential was used to access the device, or sorry, the network uh, and ex execute malicious code on the store point of sale systems. Uh, they confirmed the date of compromise as being early December 1st and the containment midday on December 16th. So just under two days, about 36 hours, I believe it was. Uh, they also verified there was no evidence contradicting uh, Acme's investigator investigatory findings. So uh, this was good. Um, you know, they they basically agreed with Raymond's investigation, which, uh, you know, everybody was happy with that. So at first glance, two days, is pretty good. Uh, in 2016, the average uh, time to detection was, uh, was 70 days. So uh, two days is pretty good. But uh, in hindsight, all the signs were there. The emails, um, Bit9, uh, Windows Defender, SCCM were all screaming that there was an issue. Uh, this could have been detected and contained on the first day if anybody had been paying attention to any of the, of the email alerts. So this is pretty common. Uh, today, environments are pretty complex. Uh, there's a lot of logs generated because of poor logging implementation. People think that just you can just log everything and let the SIM sort it out. Uh, that's a bad idea. What actually happens is there's so many alerts, uh, admins quickly start to suffer, suffer from alert fatigue. And as a result, uh, the important logs start to get lost in, in the noise. All right, so some lessons learned here. So first one, uh, there was insufficient and missing two-factor authentication on external systems. Right? LogMeIn had multi-factor option, multi op options available, but it was not implemented. There was poor communication. So aside from the senior administrator, and the IT director, the rest of the IT team was left in the dark. 
Uh, they were told to swap out point of sales till, tills, but they were not told why. Stores were not advised of the situation, so there was no sense of urgery, urgency for them to swap out tills when they received them. Uh, main reason was management management did not trust their staff to keep their mouths quiet and to keep the breach under wraps. So this led to, unfortunately, uh, lo- uh, waiting too long to get systems pulled offline, right? And delays getting them offline meant delays getting back to headquarters, which meant delays in getting them into the investigation. So the tech support team did not understand uh, the issue and felt that there was no rush to replace this, the affected systems. On top of that, the business was unwilling to shut down any of the stores. They didn't want to incur any lost revenue while replacement systems were being shipped out. Uh, on top of that, the retail stores, because they didn't know anything that was going on, uh, they weren't overly motivated motivated to ship old systems back to headquarters. Um, it was the middle of Christmas season; they were busy. Uh, so once they got new systems, in pl- once they got new systems, uh, sometimes they swapped them out. Uh, sometimes they just sat in the back room uh, to deal be dealt with after the after the Christmas season. Main reason here: they had no context. Right, all they knew was they were getting new systems. Didn't understand the importance of sending the old ones back and the old ones back in a timely fashion. They figured they'd just get to it when they got to it. So this is a danger here in keeping your staff in the dark. Uh, it's a catch-22 though. So you can either tell them and risk uh, information leaking, or you can go cloak and dagger out and deal with the lack of the, of the urgency. So the log retention on the forty forty manager, again, was insufficient. Uh, again, was configured for one, one terabyte, but due to the uh, underlying dispartition, uh, logs were not being uh, being kept as, as was, was thought to be. Uh, those firewall logs were also not being shipped off into the SIM. So as a result, by the time the investigation was underway, uh, most of the firewall logs were gone. Uh, the log management program was very poorly implemented. Acme was kind of of the stance that they could just throw all the logs at the SIM and let it figure it out. But as you know, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, the alerts were there. Systems were screaming that something was wrong, uh, but there was too many noisy alerts. Alert fatigue set in and nobody bothered to pay attention. Uh, the incident was also not reported to initially to the bank. Uh, the bank did contact them uh, a couple of days after the incident, but uh, they did not initially report this to the bank. And there was no proper planning, right? So there was no incident response retainer, uh, incident response retainer in place. Uh, this meant scrambling in the heat of the moment. Fortunately, Acme was able to take advantage of the recently recent industry contract contact, and there was insufficient training for the staff. Aside from the senior administrator, uh, none of the security team had none of the IT team had, had, had any security training, or whatever. And unfortunately, uh, Raymond, uh, his only job, security was not his only job. Now, some of the containment steps they took. Uh, first thing, they updated some firewall rule sets, so they blocked external suspicious IP communications. They limited network connections to the bare minimum that was required. Uh, they streamlined the network and system alert notifications by reducing uh, the event noise. Uh, they worked with the teams to tune the events properly so they weren't uh, uh, creating a lot of noise and then uh, eliminated the, the rules that were people had created within Outlook to then uh, make sure that people were actually seeing the, the email alerts. Uh, and then they implemented a, rota- a rotating on-call staff as well. Uh, Bit9 and Carbon Black was used to, uh, to uh, uh, prevent the mil- any malicious files from attacking the endpoints. Uh, this meant escalating the timelines on the path to high enforcement mode, uh, which was the ultimate goal, but you know, they just had to speed it up and get there faster than they were expecting. Uh, they did have to reset passwords for all the compromised user ac- accounts as well. Now, within LogMe itself, LogMe in itself, uh, there was a couple things that were done. Uh, first, they removed all the cached credentials uh, from LogMe in. They blocked the ability for users to save credentials in LogMe in, implemented two-factor authentication in, in LogMe in as well. Uh, these are all, again, things that should have been done from the get-go, but were overlooked due to rushed implementation and improper product planning. Uh, and then finally, the, they rebuilt and replaced all of the infected retail systems as well as the uh, Raymond or the R. Hansen's uh, end-user laptop. All right, so let's look at the financial this, uh, impact here. So the first thing was the shipping costs. There was 24 compromised systems uh, but that involved 85 separate shipments between Verizon, Rendition, InfoSec, and Acme. There was consultant costs. So there's the PFI costs, uh, Verizon's costs that included flights, hotels, uh, taxis, uh, food. Uh, there was the cost for Rendition InfoSec to do their investigation. Uh, there was the cost for the CEO's third-party consultant. And then there was legal costs with the corporate lawyers uh, to consult with them, uh, as well as them sitting in calls with the banks. There was staff and labor costs. You had the security investigation itself. Uh, you had tech support labor, uh, which included you know reimaging systems, replacing systems, uh, and then you had some uh, labor costs to backfill Raymond's normal day-to-day tasks while he was working on the incident itself. 
at the end of the day, uh, only um, 86 credit cards were, were compromised. This was confirmed by both Acme and the bank. Uh, the banks were not overly concerned uh, with 86 cards. Uh, they simply reissued cards, uh, advised Acme to wrap up, wrap up the investigation, but did still force them to go through uh, the whole investigation process. At the end of the day, the total cost uh, uh, to a uh, financial impact to Acme was $1.2 million for 24 systems and 85 credit cards. Uh, fortunately for the Acme, there were no uh, fines that were levied by the banks, which was, uh, which was, uh, you know, could have been worse. All right, so some key takeaways here. Number one, stress. This is going to take away, take you away from your regular day-to-day -day job. If security is something that you do off the side of your desk, it will push all of your other responsibilities to the side during an incident. It will have effects on your family and your personal life. You're going to be working long hours. You're going to be working late. You're going to be working weekends, holidays. If your daughter has a soccer game, plan on missing it. You are going to have uncomfortable calls at odd times with, with C-level employees, right? Your CEO is busy. They travel a lot. They'll call you at updates for updates at whatever time they have available. And those times are likely not going to be convenient for you. Second thing, make sure your systems are deployed and configured properly, right? Think back to the 40 manager, log me in, full disencryption, the firewall rule sets, right? Knowing what the, the actual minimal network requirements are. All this goes back to the preparation phase. Trust the vendors, but verify for yourself, right? The, the If you recall, the point of sale vendor had no idea traffic was going to, to Hong Kong and, and uh, you know other places. So uh, there's a lot of shipping that's going to take place, right? If you don't have an investigation team uh, that's located in the same city as you, you're going to be shipping systems cross country. So factor this in when you're getting systems replaced, sent back for analysis, it's going to take longer to get the systems back uh, in it as well. You're going to get pushback from people. Uh, you're going to get people in the field that just don't understand the, the sense of urgency, especially if you don't understand why you want them back in the first place. So if your organization is trying to keep this hush hush and you simply don't have any context to explain the, the urgency to the issues or to the, to the users, sorry. Uh, too many cooks in the kitchen is a real thing as well. Uh, there's a danger in having too many investigatory partners in the mix. Uh, eventually, they will start tripping over each other. You're going to spend a lot of time coordinating between them and trying to keep track of who has what drive, who's got what image. Uh, and this can get challenging. Alert fatigue as well. Uh, between December 1st at 6 in the morning and December 2nd at 6 a.m., a 24-hour period, there was over 230 email alerts. Uh, sorry, 238 email alerts indicating the problem. Uh, nobody dealt with that problem, right? So they make it jumbled in with a million other alerts. Maybe the security guy's busy doing his other job. Uh, so make sure you take the time to tune those alerts uh, to limit, to minimize the alert fatigue. And then lack of communication, right? Everyone thought someone else was dealing with the issue or they just didn't see the emails in the first place. If you're not communicating the why, uh, then how is the tech support team supposed to understand the urgency if you've left them in the dark? Right. At the end of the day, too, uh, moving systems offline is not your decision. Right? You don't get to make the decision to take them offline. You make the recommendation and you plead your case. But at the end of the day, taking a system offline or not is a business decision. And the sooner that we come to, term with, to terms with that will lower your stress level and the better you're going to sleep at night. Well, that is it. Dale, you okay? I'm good. You okay, buddy? I'm Dale, good. You, you did great. Buddy. Good job. I don't even know what time it is. I, it's one fifty-three. We got time for questions, Dale. For questions. Oh boy, no, questions. Have so many hearts. Yeah. How, how you feel? It was your first. It was your first one. Feel good. My mouth's a little dry. <laughs> <laughs> how about you take a sip of water? I'm gonna talk to yeah. the. The, everyone that's here for a second, and then we'll uh, we'll answer. I mean, some I need a nap now. Yeah. I can't imagine how you yeah. feel. <laughs> so, uh, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're moving into a time of Q and A. Uh, so, most likely, what happened was you asked a question at some point, and either that question got answered or it did not. And so, if you could do me a favor, ask that question again, so that way it shows up in the the top of my list of questions to ask Dale. Uh, if we get a whole lot of questions, we'll see if Dale can stick around for an extra few minutes of post-show banter. Mm. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, please ask the questions that you have. And, and Dale, you're getting a lot of like, that was great. That was also, that was fast. Uh, so 
I know that you had a lot of material to go through. And so for those of you that are not used to watching a webcast at 1.5 speed <laughs> it's kind of what uh, I was or like. a podcast at 1.5 speed, <laughs> it happens. It happens. Uh, also, since it, I don't know if you've ever spoken public, uh, I have. Uh, there are times where like you just you just get so excited. You get so excited. You just want to keep going. Uh, and so. I think as time goes on, Dale, I think you'll find your rhythm. But this rhythm, for some people, it was like, they that's my rhythm. They're like, I'll make it faster. Yeah. yeah. I have been told that I'm a fast talker. Yeah. Uh, so I know when I've hired people at other jobs in the past, they're always like, how do you how do you understand anything? And I'm like, I don't know. I just talk. And then a month later, <laughs> a couple months later, we hire someone new. And then they're like, how do you guys know what he's talking about? They're like, I don't know. We just got up to speed with Dale's speed. And then I'm like, he's Canadian. I don't know. That's how they talk up there. Yeah. <laughs> helpful, a helpful hint, though. Like, if you're going to watch this and you need to rewatch it because it was too fast, you can go to YouTube and slow it down. Slow <laughs> it down. Yeah. My voice gets very deep. But yeah, your your new nickname, I guess, is Fast Talking fast Dale. Dale. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I can All right. So looking for questions. Yes. Um, I think one of the questions, do you have a favorite tool for taking the image? Um, I think we, uh, the one I'm used to is um, not DD. That's an old school, but uh, I forget the name right now. Haven't had to do it in a long time. Um, shoot. I'm drawing a blank on it. I can't think of it. I'll come back to it okay. that one when I think of it. All right. Let's see. Let's is see. this whole scenario fictitious? Yeah. Or is no. the names have been changed to protect the innocent? The names have been changed. The, the incident is not fictitious. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was the problem of the firewall? Uh, the problem with the firewall is that, not the firewall itself, but the central console where all the firewall logs were shipped to, not the SIM, that's kind of an intermediary, the, the 40 manager. Uh, that device was configured to store one terabyte of logs. But the underlying disk partition itself out of the box from the factory was only configured for one gig of disk space. In the documentation, it clearly stated that you needed to expand that to accommodate whatever size this uh, uh, log storage you wanted. But unfortunately, Raymond did not see that in the, in the, uh, in the documentation. And so uh, their logs you know, rolled over pretty quickly, a couple hours. Uh, Raj said, really felt the intensity of the incident response. So I think that was that, the goal. That was the goal. The whole goal, Jason. That's the whole speed thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I that think for clear. clarity, and I think most people got this, but just for clarity, Raymond was IT security and IR? <laughs> yes. He was all of it. Okay. Except for tech support, basically. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and I think sometimes people who watch these webcasts, are, they are that one person shop. They are IT. They are security. They are incident response. And uh, if you're here right now, then congratulations, like well done that you're here. <laughs> like I was Yeah. at my previous position, <laughs> Oh yeah. small little mom and pop automotive repair shop. That was me. Like I was all of that. And that's yeah. not what you want. Yeah. I mean, I did an okay job, but still, it's, yeah, it's a lot to be all of that. Uh, let's see. Uh, most people wondered, was it FTK was what you were Oh wondering? yes, that's it. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. They are crying. Uh, a lot of people were like, Axiom? Uh, <laughs> uh, did law enforcement get involved in this investigation? At what point do you decide to include them? Uh, they did not. Um, the business did not feel it was necessary to include law enforcement. Verizon didn't feel it was necessary. Uh, the only people that really got involved with it was the banks. <laughs> and again, because it was only 86 credit cards, to them it was easier to just to reissue new credit cards and, yeah. and move on. Mm. Uh, one of the attendees said, my boss doesn't believe in alert fatigue because he wants to know what noise is normal. How do I change his mind? I get 500 to 700 SIM alerts incidents a day. Send them all to his inbox. <laughs> <laughs> Here's your noise. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. That was quick. He had an answer for that right away. Uh, someone doesn't trust that you're Canadian because he didn't say A. Eh once so i tried really hard not to but <laughs> sorry if i let you down sorry if i let you down uh, but there it is that that'll do <laughs> oh sorry uh what tools would bhis use for finding suspicious network connections such as ftp connections in the breach discussed oh um rita rita and, sure. uh, yeah 
AC Hunter. AC Hunter. AC Hunter, yeah. Uh, so Rita is free, uh, R I T A. Uh, Rita is free and AC Hunter. Uh, there's a community edition that you can use to learn on, uh, or you could also get the Enterprise Edition, which I think is so inexpensive. It is less than the sales tax of other people's threat hunting tools. Okay. That was it. <laughs> All right, let's do. I noticed that one of the root calls in alert fatigue. Does this imply that the security team may, may need additional team members, or, or does reviewing the alert classification help? Um, in this particular case, uh, something I didn't cover on was that after the investigation was all wrapped up, uh, security was obviously a little bit more, um, uh, a little more for top of mind, and uh, they did approve Raymond to hire uh, a couple of people to make up a to form an actual incident or to form an actual security team within the organization. So that actually worked out in his favor as well. So unfortunately, sometimes a breach is what you need to to move things forward. Uh, it's unfortunate, but sometimes that's what it takes. Uh, Dale, I'm going to have you give your, your final thoughts. We're going to wrap up this actual webcast, and then we'll do a little post-show banter for Q&A. So, Dale, give us your final thoughts on today's uh, webcast. Yeah, just be prepared that it's going to throw you for a loop it's, when it happens. Um, as much planning as you think you've done for it, there's always going to be something that you've, that you've missed or something you overlooked or something that was misconfigured. Uh, and then uh, if you're in a, in a situation where you're the only guy who's wearing multiple hats, um, yeah. It's tough. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us for this uh, Black Hills Information Security webcast. If you ever need a pen test, threat hunt, red team, anti-sock or sock, uh, you know where to find us. And if you're like, what's an anti-sock? It's like, imagine just what a sock is, yeah. but then someone's just attacking just you all the time. Continuous pen testing. Just like, continuous. All like always pen Sounds testing. terrible. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So Dale, we're going to stick around. We're going to do a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it. All right. So... Dale, we're going to stick around for about 10 minutes or so uh, post-show banter. So if we still got questions, we're going to ask those. And then uh, we'll be all done for today. Sounds good. Uh, is, uh, we already asked it. So this was a real scenario. Uh, yep. Just to answer that question. Uh, we're all supposed to have cyber insurance. But what role does insurance play in a scenario like this? Insurance does not prevent the problem. Mm. Um, yeah, it doesn't prevent the problem. Um, but I think... I mean, I haven't dealt with much with insurance, but my understanding is that a lot of insurance companies are starting to move away from um, being protecting from things like uh, phishing and whatnot, just because it happens so much that it's costing them money, I guess. Uh, but um, I don't know. My my take on, on insurance is more, probably less from a security standpoint and more from a disaster, disaster recovery standpoint where you need to replace equipment, um, you know, that may be burnt up in a fire or something like that. But, uh, what is the minimum adequate log period? Ooh, I would say probably like real-time logs or long-term storage. Long-term storage as long as you can. Real-time, I would say probably six to nine months would be my probably my guess, or my thought. Uh, attribution, does that matter? First of all, does attribution matter? Mm -hmm. Second, can you uh, give some attribution to this actual attack? Uh, attribution gets to be tough because, you know, there's, you can bounce around through VPNs and all this through the Tor network and all that stuff. So it gets to be tough. Um, and realistically, I don't know what you do with it. I mean, okay, sure. You find that some guy in Russia did something, but who's going to do anything about it, right? You, you know, the US secret service isn't going to go knock on his door and arrest him. And, you know, so unless there's some kind of, uh, what do they call it, extradition uh, agreements with the country, I don't think, um, I don't think it's really going to do you much good, but that's just my opinion. Uh, someone asked, and I answered the question. They said, uh, where can you get an IR retainer and how much does that normally cost? And so I answered the question, Black Hills does do IR retainers, not to be self, you know, like, yay, <laughs> uh, but we do. So if you ever want an incident response retainer with Black Hills, we do offer incident response services. Uh, but Dale, where would someone go to to like find an incident response third party to help? Um, you just have to search or hunt for them. Like there's lots of big name vendors. Like, um, you know, obviously we have one at Black Hills. Um, Rendition InfoSec doesn't there. I don't know if the company that bought them, Breach Quest, I don't know if they do retainers or not. Uh, some of the other ones like Dell SecureWorks does retainers. Some of the big, most of the bigger name security companies, I think do, uh, do offer them. Uh, could you but please recommend... 
a, right. oh, go ahead. I, I just want to throw out as well that that kind of goes back to your preparation phase, right? You don't want to be hunting Google and looking through the yellow pages or Google yeah. pages to try and find yeah. one when you're in the live incident. So yeah. get that stuff done in, in advance. Okay. Uh, now, Ray, Raymond lucked out. He met, you know, that he met Jake, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm going to have you stop sharing your screen too because um, yeah, yeah, sure. we'll, we'll be full size. Mm -hmm. uh, I will make a recommendation for the game that we created called Backdoors and Breaches. It's an instant response card game that you can play before the incident happens. And so that way you can get into the habit of like, do we have something in place for this? Do we have these logs? Do we have this? Do we have that? Do we have these things? And so if you never heard of Backdoors and Breaches before, I'll drop the link into the chat and you can go ahead and get the game. It's completely free, open source. If you ever want a demo, uh, we'll do free demos for you so that your organization can learn how to play internally before you actually play yourself. All right. Uh, could you recommend? Could you please recommend a case management system to track the alert slash case? I uh, honestly don't know. I've never used one. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep track of everything? Uh, me personally, uh, a notebook, old-fashioned notebook, pen and paper. Um, can that be subpoenaed? Uh, probably. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if, if you're using a notebook um, and you've got dates and times on it, um, first of all, you know, yeah, sure, it could probably be subpoenaed. But also, if you're, you know, keeping good notes and you keeping track of things, then uh, you have a good time frame of when things, things happen as well, too. So, I mean, you have that with any case managing tool as well. I, I just never used any. So, I guess I'm old school and I like to, you know, keep up on my writing skills because you don't get to use them anywhere else. So. Also, uh, I just recently watched the entire season of Suits, so I'm saying things like objection uh, and uh, <laughs> subpoena. Right to your head. And uh, I, I'm pretty sure I could, you know, in a court of law, and get someone. Are you ready to switch gears? Are PFI look? services typically included in incident response retainers? Uh, no. So, <clears throat> just because a company offers incident response retainers doesn't mean they have they offer PFI services. So when you go on the PCI. Council's website, they have a list of of, uh, of people who are, are, I don't know if they want to, call, I'm not sure if certified is the right way, but people who are kind of vetted as uh, PFI investiga investigation, investigatory companies. So there's a list of them on the PCI DSS website. And Stephen said, uh, get backdoors and breaches. It can really help mature a younger IR team org. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate yeah, that. You can play online for free. Just posted that link there. And I'm yeah. pretty sure the lawyers and suits punch more people than they subpoena. Uh, and someone said, I think NCASE is a forensic program for case tracking. <laughs> so as a po posing lawyer, what do you think? Do you punch more people than you subpoena? I don't know. <laughs> uh, does Rita AC100 do the same as what Darktrace would do? Um, talk to active countermeasures. Uh, your Darktrace, here, here's the difference. All right, real quick. Darktrace has an entire sales team that's going to hound you for quite some time to tell you all the cool things they can do. Uh, we don't. Uh, we don't at Active Countermeasures. Uh, if you want to contact us, we'll tell you all the things that we can do. I will tell you, Darktrace is a lot more expensive. To... Mm. Yes. yes. Uh, ours is cost less than the sales tax of <laughs> other programs. All right. uh, I think that's it, Dale. I'm looking to see if there's any more questions. Uh, someone said, I missed a portion of this. How soon will it be available? Uh, pretty much as soon as this is over, it's going to be available on YouTube. And then Ryan's going to go through and cut off the pre-show banter. Why? Because when someone's doing a search for something, they don't want to sit through 24 minutes of us being absolutely hilarious and wonderful. Uh, they want to get their question answered and that's okay. Uh, but you came for pre-show banter. Uh, it happens before every single webcast. You show up 30 minutes before the actual webcast and you get to see all of us hanging out. And hanging out. Uh, Dale. Yes. Anything else? Is there something that you missed that you're like, if I don't say this, I'm going to be thinking about it the whole rest of the day. Is there anything well, like now that? He's, now he's Because uh, you did. <laughs> yeah. No. I don't. Check think. your notebook. What's in there? I can't remember everything else. I can't think of anything else. I think I covered it all. Okay. And I'm going to ask everyone that's still stuck around, uh, Do you, would you like Dale to do another webcast like this in the future? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, if we get a lot of no's, I'm going to be like, oh, never mind, never mind, never mind. I don't think there's a uh, thumbs down yeah. in Zoom, no, so. <laughs> Dale, thank you for sharing your knowledge today. Thank you for doing this. And I'm going to ask you, as we wrap up, why were you willing to do a webcast today? Hmm. Um, 
Well, first off, I hadn't done them before, so I thought, you know, might, might as well. And second, um, I find that people don't talk about incidents enough. Um, you know, whenever an incident happens, I feel people are trying to keep it quiet, as quiet as possible. They tell you limited information about it. Uh, to me, so to me, because I knew Raymond very well, I, I kind of uh, helped Raymond through a lot of this. Um, I knew all the ins and outs of it. And um, I just kind of thought, well, it would be good for people to see the parts that people don't see in the news. Yeah. Unless you've lived through one. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you, Dale. I think uh, for a lot of people who've been through incidents, they were like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I remember That's that. That's exactly oh, oh. what it was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If you're coming to Wild West Hacking Fest, we'll see you there in October. Uh, if you're coming, please let us know. Deb and I will be at the airport to greet you and Rapid City. Uh, it's like one, yeah, one thing you, to fly. One, what is it? Yeah, <laughs> you fly in Rapid City. There's one runway. Like three minutes later, you're at the baggage claim. Yeah, we'll Fantastic. Dale, are you coming to Wild West Hacking Fest? I am, yes. Fantastic. We'll get a chance to see you and hang out. I wish I had a class week. that week. Yeah. You do have a class that week. Yes. Uh, what yeah. class are you teaching that week? Mine is the uh, Hacking Active, Dir- Active Directory. Hacking I got the Active idea from Directory? you. Yeah, I got the idea from you last year. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, we'll talk about that the rest of the day. Yeah. Oh, we're walking a little bit taller today. <laughs> there you go. Glad Thank I you, can... everyone. We'll see you next time. We appreciate you being here. We know that you could have spent your hour and a half doing anything today, and you decided to spend it with us, and we appreciate that. Uh, stick around in Discord and get your questions ans- answered to any information security question you might have. Uh, there's a whole community here that wants to see you succeed, and we hope you stick around for it. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Kill it. Kill it, Ryan. Ryan. Fire. Kill it with fire. Get it. Kill it, Ryan. Get it. Ryan.